Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, mahaba, monu muliwanji, namaste, jambo, bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We're coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted and so very honored and so wicked happy that you're joining us in our mission to help families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to tell all of your family and friends about the show and please subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Good Pods, Podcast Addicts, Stitcher Radio, wherever you find your podcast. Our guest today is a Hollywood superstar, a math genius, a mom, and the author of Double Puppy Trouble, Danica McKellar. Before we invite Danica into the studio, we want to let you know that this episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by the adventures of Toby Baxter, the river elf, the giant, and the closet. A thrilling middle grade novel by Tim Wright. He's ready to leave kingdom behind. But can he stand tall against an army of barf-inducing beasts? Toby Baxter can't wait to be a teenager. On the cusp of turning 13, the superhero-obsessed boy's jaw drops when a baffling stranger appears and begs him for help. But when he's led through a portal on a whirlwind trip to a magical land, he's terrified to be plunged mid-battle between elves and a legion of stinky trolls. I love this book. You're going to love it, too. Your kids are going to love it. And what a great book to read with your tweens and your teens. The Adventures of Toby Baxter, the River Elf, the Giant, and the Closet. It is a Reading With Your Kids certified great read written by Tim Wright. Get your copy today. This episode of the podcast is also brought to you by Skipper, Friend, or Foe, a distracting mystery within life's traumatic events, written by Kelly Sanchez. It's also a Reading With Your Kids certified great read. And in this book, we meet Michael, who appears to be leading a pretty normal life for a happy 12-year-old boy, until the unthinkable happens. His mom is diagnosed with cancer. Michael's dad has to take a job out of town because the treatments cost so much and it's the only way they can afford to treat her. Suddenly, Michael is no longer a carefree kid. He's now his mom's caretaker. When a new friend convinces Michael to follow a mysterious adventure, Michael discovers that it's not all up to him to take care of his mom. He learns that it's okay to have some fun even through some of life's toughest moments. It's a really, really powerful middle grade novel. You want to check it out. It's Skipper, Friend of Foe, A Distracting Mystery Within Life's Traumatic Events by Kelly Sanchez. It's available on Amazon and it is a Reading With Your Kids certified great read. Joining us right now to celebrate her brand new picture book. It's called Double Puppy Trouble. Please welcome to the show New York Times bestselling author and the driving force behind McKellarMath.com, Denica McKellar. Hey, Denica, how are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm wonderful. I'm really excited about this. I just finished reading Double Puppy Trouble, and what a delightful little book it is. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's a lot of fun. I, the illustrator did an amazing job. You know, it's the puppies everywhere. My son, he's 11 years old. He loves puppies. He's lo- he loves all baby animals. And so a lot of people ask me about my books, like, what's your inspiration? I mean, it's, it's my son. My son is my inspiration. Well, nowadays, I started writing books before he was born, um, like the middle school and the high school books. But now for the little kid books, uh, it's, it's, that's all Draco. That's, isn't it great to have um, a little person that you love around you every day to inspire you? Oh, yeah, it's the best. Yeah. He's the best. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about the story in Double Puppy Trouble. Yes. So just a quick overview. I write books, as you mentioned, at mckellarmath.com. I've got all my books uh, for ages zero, like babies, all the way through high school geometry, 16 years old. And there's a big slider button there at mckellarmath.com to show you, depending on your child's age, what's the best book. So a lot of the books teach math concepts, like really dig in there, like 
making it fun, but really genuinely teaching math with exercises and explanations and things. Um, like I said, all the way through high school geometry, all through elementary school, like every grade. Uh, but I also do picture books that are just fun books that sneak a little math in. And Double Puppy Trouble fits into that category of McKellar math book. Uh, Double Puppy Trouble is the story of a little girl named Moxie who wants more of everything. She just wants more. Well, be careful what you wish for because she finds a stick where if you push the button and point it at something, that thing will double. And she decides to double their puppy. Well, the button gets stuck. And so the puppies just keep doubling and doubling and they don't stop. So we see the puppies and then there are more puppies and then there are more. It's 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256. And it just goes, we actually, um, I show one page with all the numbers doubling. It goes to 1,024. But it's so cute and so fun. And so what I'm doing with this is creating a happy, friendly, fun-loving association between big numbers and puppies. So, you know, my hope is that kids will, from a very young, young age, think of big numbers getting out of control as being the cutest thing ever. And uh, exponential growth, of course, is what is being demonstrated here. That's the math concept that's snuck in. Uh, and it's just adorable. It's, it, it, you know, it's, it's puppy mayhem. There's on the page that has all the numbers getting really big in particular, there are puppies spilling out of the house, sliding down the roof. It's a big wide shot and puppies are just getting into all kinds of trouble, turning on the hose outside, creating this big flood and they get their little muddy little paws all over everything because they run back inside and, and then they, and they just keep doubling. So, uh, I had a blast with this and, it, it sort of reminded me from my childhood of 101 Dalmatians meets Fantasia, you know, yeah. just where the, the, uh, a kid gets con- powers that they don't know how to, how to control. Yeah. At the, at the end of the day, though, you know, it's, it's not just teaches math, but also uh, teaches the lesson that sometimes less is more and to be grateful for what we have. Yeah, that the scene, the spread at the end where Moxie and her brother are playing together and cooperating to build that tower yeah. is really sweet. I mean, there's, you just kind of feel the sweetness and that relationship coming off the page. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. It's, I, you know, telling stories that, that warm the heart, that's that's what I've done my entire life on screen. And, and I love being able to bring that same sensibility to a little math yeah. and, uh, and to kids through a book. Yeah, you mentioned being on screen. You a, a lot of people remember you from The Wonder Years and mm-hmm. also The West Wing and all sorts of Hallmark Channel films. And um, you've had an amazing career as a storyteller. Thank you. Yeah, I I, um, I counted. I've done 16 Hallmark Channel movies, and now I'm doing movies for a new network called Great American Family or GAC Family. So it's the same guy who ran Hallmark Channel for 20 years, started this new network, and it's, it's a lot of fun. I've got um, – I'm more of an executive producer role and, and uh, multi-picture deal. It's really exciting. It's the same kind of movies, though, obviously, same guy who ran Hallmark Channel for so long. It's about warming the heart, and it's – you know, people say, oh, these movies are such a great escape. And You know, I don't think they're just an escape. I really think of these movies as a way of, of demonstrating um, – uh, Behaviors that we all could 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 take on ourselves. Christmas traditions, like, oh, well, you know, if that's a great idea for something we could do with my family. Um, you know, really modeling behavior that that is going to make the world a better place. So it's not just escaping to a fantasy world, but it's about being reminded of the good stuff, the good side of human nature, because we see so much of the opposite on the news. Mm-hmm. So it's Great American Family. And I have one movie on that channel already called The Winter Palace. And um, that'll be re-airing a few times. And then my new Christmas movie will be on this channel as well. Super, super. And one of the things I think you do with Double Double Puppy Trouble is you're giving families, um, obviously, a fun story. But you're also giving families a tool they can use to help their kids have that friendly positive relationship with numbers that, that you were mentioning earlier. Because I, I know myself, and so many kids are just intimidated by math and by numbers. Exactly. Well, that's my whole mission with my Keller Math Book, starting at the very earliest of ages with good night numbers and bath time, math time, you know, like the, the <laughs> wanting to get to kids as early as possible. Now, the most crucial age for math and confidence in kids is middle school. And that's why I started writing my books. Like, Math Doesn't Suck was my first book. Um, you can see it here. 
uh, Math Doesn't Suck, Kiss My Math, these books from middle school are the most crucial because that is the age where kids, especially girls, um, but all kids start to lose confidence in math. Their grades aren't dropping yet, but their confidence is dropping. And so that, that's the most crucial age. But after I wrote those books, people were saying, we want books for younger, books for younger. I'm like, you know what? That's true. You, you, there's no age that's too young to create a happy association with math mm-hmm. and, and, and to start building that confidence and start building that, just that, that sense of that numbers are your friends. In fact, that's actually a line out of good night numbers, <laughs> um, that numbers are your friends. Mm-hmm. So that, you know, that to me is, is such a, a wonderful opportunity. And as a storyteller, as an entertainer my whole life, I can't, I can't imagine uh, a better use of entertainment than to help kids gain that internal confidence in themselves and that that's going to help them to embrace their smarts and to embrace math, become more financially savvy as they get older. Because let's face it, kids who are afraid of numbers tend to be adults who avoid numbers. And those adults are the ones that the credit card companies and other financial institutions like to rip off. Einstein said something really cool about compound interest. He said, it's the eighth wonder of the world. Those who understand it, earn it. Those who don't, pay it. Mm. (laughs) Well, you know, that is absolutely true. And one of the things that we've explored here on the Reading With Your Kids podcast is just how important it is for us as parents to help our kids become financially literate. Yes. And the first way to do that is becoming comfortable and literate when it comes to numbers. Yes. We talk yeah, absolutely. And, and so it's not, and it, and it's not just the financial literacy that, that is the, um, to me, the most important gift of math, although that's a really important one. But the other one is that the exercising the problem solving part of your brain, because it's the one section of your brain that solves problems, that solves puzzles, solves a math problem, that solves a dilemma when it comes at you. You know, what are the actual facts? What my emotions are clouding my judgment. What do I actually know? How can I actually solve this? What are the steps I can take? And being able to think logically and, and having that problem solving part of your brain really in good shape. Math does that for you. Math does that for you. And kids have to be in math anyway. So why not, why not use this opportunity? to become a better problem solver and become somebody who you know that you're training yourself as a kid. You're training yourself to understand that you are the kind of person who's good at at handling challenges and obstacles because life is going to throw so many challenges and obstacles at all of us, our entire lives, things we never would have expected. And are we the kind of person who gets intimidated by difficult things or can we build ourselves up from a young age to say, you know what, this looks really tough. It's a good thing I've got me on my side because mm, I, I know how to handle stuff like this. It's a good thing I got me on my side because I've tackled challenges before. I've faced seemingly insurmountable problems, math problems before and thought I couldn't do it, but then I stuck with it and I did it. That's the kind of stuff. That's the kind of internal fortitude that I want to give these kids. And that's why I write these books. It's not just for the math and the financial savviness, which is all very important, crucially important, but it's really because we, as a society, I feel like, Kids more and more are looking towards the outside for validation. They're looking to other, to, you know, the social media and, mm-hmm. and all, also this, this world we've lived in for a long time, decades and decades. You need these products to be happy. You need these products to be okay. Well, no, maybe not. Maybe you need to build your own sense of self and your own confidence, um, that comes from feeling capable. Maybe that's the key to happiness. Maybe the key to happiness isn't other products or getting the most likes on social media. Maybe the key to happiness is feeling good about yourself and knowing that you are a solid human being who can handle whatever life throws at you. So that to me is the the most important gift of mathematics and getting kids comfortable with it and embracing their smarts and embracing these challenges that math class will inevitably bring. Yeah. I love the passion that you have because I not not, not only can can I see it, but I can hear it in your voice. This is something that you are really committed to. And I, I love that. And I, I, as you're talking, you know, we, we for five years have been talking and sharing with parents how important it is to read with your kids and all the benefits that they get from reading together. Well, I think, and we've touched on it a little bit here in the podcast, doing math together or mathing <laughs> together. I don't know how you do that, but, <laughs> you know, math with your kids. Solving, solving together, right. Yeah, yep. solving together, sitting down and, 
helping your kids understand, yes, you have this mountain of a problem, but you don't have to start at the top. You can take a little bit and a little bit and a little bit and just work your way up that mountain. That's true. Now, what I've had a lot of parents tell me is, what do I do? The math looks different now. I don't, I don't know how to help my kids. Like even parents, some parents say I could never do math. Others say I was okay at math, but now I really don't get it. Well, regardless, I do recommend parents looking at my books first before you give it to your kids. If you're in that boat, if you are feeling like you're not, you know, confident to help your kids. Uh, and in particular, in terms of the math looking different, I've got two books which are not behind me. I have so many books that they're not even all behind me right now. Um, one's called Do Not Open This Math Book. It's for first and second graders. The other one is The Times Machine for third and fourth graders. And again, these are all at mckellarmath.com. But the elementary school is where the math looks the most different um, from how it looked 10, 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. And in both of those books, I have a new math translation guide for grownups in the back specifically designed for the grown-ups, the parents who are like, what is all this? What is regrouping? I thought it was called borrowing, you know, whatever it is. There are a lot of changes or, you know, uh, multiplication is taught very differently and division is taught very differently. They've managed to make it really complicated. Uh, but, but what I do in the books too is I'll say, okay, here's how we learned it. Here's what they're doing. Here's how it's really the same thing. It's just kind of dressed up differently. Mm -hmm. And so I really, I take, great pride in helping parents to get what's actually going on and to know, no, no, you're not stupid. And it's not as different as you think. Here's what's going on. I can walk you through this and then you can walk your kids through it and, and, and have a little more confidence instead of going out, throwing your hands up and saying, I just, I have no idea. Good luck, kid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that's not what we want. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I do educational magic shows around the country and there is one, one trick that I did for years and it involved a math problem and a prediction and lining up the numbers and columns and everything. And I had to throw it away because the kids were like not understanding <laughs> what I was doing. Oh my goodness. <laughs> one right. of the th yes. Yeah. Yes. One of the things I noticed on, on McKellarMath.com is your, your s slogan of the, f the fun way to do the right thing for your child's math education. Can you kind of expand a little bit more on that, that concept? Yes, absolutely. So the idea is that the right thing is to help your kids, to support your kids in math. It's really important for all the reasons we've just talked about, for that confidence, for the financial savviness. Um, but it's, it's, it can be daunting. Mm. So with my background in, in entertainment, I've made entertaining ways to help your kids in math and entertaining ways for kids to help themselves in math. It's got to be fun. I, I just figure why, why shouldn't math be like kindergarten? And I, you know, I love math. I have a degree in mathematics from UCLA. I've studied everything. Multivariable calculus was just the beginning. You know, I, I've, I've studied it all. Well, not all. I shouldn't say it all. See, that's my, my math literal self. There's tons of math that I haven't studied because there's so much math out there. Um, that not even one, I don't think one person could learn all the math that is out there, uh, in one lifetime. Anyway, uh, there's a fun way to do it. And, and I have this very unique combination of life experience of being an entertainer my whole life and truly loving math, the nitty gritty of it, loving what it does for your brain and knowing how to take some typically very dry topics and make them very fun. Um, in Kiss My Math, I talk about integers. That's positive and negative whole numbers. And you're like, wow, that's the most boring thing. I can't even think of anything more boring, even than the word integer. And I talk about, this sounds like a medical instrument. Like, quick, we need to operate. Hand me the integer. Like, this is awful. <laughs> so we can't talk about integers. This is going to, it's not going to work. So instead we talk about mintagers. And so the idea of comb like having mints that taste good and the bigger the number, the better they taste. And then the negative numbers, the negative integers or the negative mintagers are the ones that just taste awful. Like those Harry Potter jelly beans with flavors like vomit, you know, mm. earwax, like it's awful. So, but the idea of mintagers is you can combine a really yummy mintager with a terribly tasting mintager and they cancel each other out. And if they cancel each other out completely, you get to zero, which is also known as the lintager that has no taste at all, like lint. Mm -hmm. yeah. So just making it kind of bring it to life like that. And uh, so that's, you know, that's just one tiny example. Even, you know, lower grades, like for the Times Machine, the book about multiplication and division, one of the things that I was really excited about doing, because I hadn't seen it done well anywhere, that is 
making a fun way for kids to learn the multiplication tables, their, their multiplication facts, because it's one of the more boring things to do, just memorizing all these, you know, okay, four times five is 20. You know, you're like memorizing all these combinations and it's mind numbing. Well, I took like not the twos or the tens, but like the ones that are more challenging. And each one has a little story, a little poem with a picture and a, to make it come to life so that you remember it better. One of my favorite ones to talk about is six times seven is 42. And uh, so Mr. Mouse is a character in both Do Not Open This Math Book and The Times Machine. Mr. Mouse is not a big fan of math, but he loves cheese. And so I said, okay, Mr. Mouse ate a six-sided block of cheese, right? A cube of cheese every day for a full week. So that's seven days. So that's your six times seven. Well, by the end of that week, Mr. Mouse was pretty full and far too, too. <laughs> no, no, I am, I am not above <laughs> using fart jokes to teach math if that is required. <laughs> because let's face it, no kid is going to forget that six times seven is 42 after that story. Mm-hmm. So this is what I mean. It's how do you bring, how do you create characters and stories and bring these numbers to life and make them fun? Give, give them personalities. And that's what makes it more memorable. And then you do feel more confident because, oh yeah, well, I'm not going to forget that one or, you know, it, it, it's, it's just about bringing it to life. Yeah. Um, storytelling is an incredible tool and superpower um, that I think can be used for, for good. And that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. I remember having a conversation and it's many years ago with um, somebody who was uh, pretty intelligent. I think he was, uh, may have been working as a professor in college and, he said to me, he goes, I don't know why we torture kids and make them learn math. We have calculators and, you know, we have machines that can do that for kids. Why do we have to bother and, and, and torture kids? And even though I'm not a mathematician by any means, I knew that it's better for us to understand the concepts, even if we can't do it and even if though if we need a machine to help us, it's, it's better to have that, that, that understanding, that foundation than to be ignorant. Well, of course, and 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 you 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 need to exercise that problem problem solving side of your brain anyway. And if you, this is a great tool for that. And you can use a calculator, but if you're not comfortable with it because you haven't really done that much, you're not going to use a calculator to double check your credit card statement to see if the APR if you're not if you're not getting ripped off. Like you're not going to do that. Yes, we should have our kids do. The stuff, but it doesn't need to be torture. Mm-hmm. That's my that's my take on it. Right. Yeah, we need to sharpen their brains and have them understand what's going on. And the thing is, if you don't learn your multiplication tables, it's not just the multiplication tables that you've, you're losing out on. Because yeah, you could type into your phone six times seven equals forty two. But let's say you're trying to reduce a fraction, you have to know what the factors are already in order to to reduce it. And, and there's so many other really cool, fun problem solving situations you're going to find yourself in. That a calculator, it's kind of too late. You have to already know what to put into the calculator. So before you can use the calculator. Mm -hmm. So yes, a calculator is an amazing tool and it's very useful, but it shouldn't replace learning these basic skills because the basic skills are what you build everything else on. And you have to have those skills to build on them. Math is incredibly cumulative. And if you just say, okay, well, they don't need to learn that. They'll just use the calculator. They're going to be hamstrung for Everything else in pre-algebra and algebra, mm-hmm. they're not going to be, they're, they're going to be like, oh, that looks really hard because I don't know where to start. Yeah, they don't know where to start because you don't know automatically that six times seven is 42. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's 42. Yeah. yeah. So, For- but if they, if they know that automatically, <laughs> then they have that foundation that they can, they can build on and they can, they can fly. Yeah. They can, they can, their, their brains can develop and, and, and take them wonderful places. Yeah. And I'm really happy that you stress this whole idea of, problem solving and helping our kids develop that problem solving muscle Mm -hmm. in their brain because math does beyond helps us just beyond numbers. It's like going to the gym for your brain. Mm -hmm. And if you only did easy math problems or only used a calculator or whatever, you wouldn't get anything out of it. You go to the gym and you lift a one pound weight. Okay. Yay. That didn't do anything. But when you struggle, that's when you get strong. That's when your muscles are engaged. And, and, and that's, that's, the good stuff in math, you want it to be challenging. Otherwise, you don't get that out of it. Yeah. You want to be challenging. You want to think, I have no idea how to do this, and then do it. That's where the gifts are. Yeah. You shared with us early on that the, 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 that your son was the inspiration for Double Puppy Trouble. What's he? What, what kind of math does he love? 
he loves problem solving as well. I mean, he's 11. I mean, I'm teaching him algebra one already because mm-hmm. I can't help it. I just can't help it. And he's, he, um, he, he, he loves feeling smart. All kids love feeling smart. So when he's not understanding something, he doesn't like math. And when he is, he loves math. If you ask him if he likes math, he's like, um, kind of, <laughs> but then he'll, but then he'll be doing something. He'll solve it and he'll get that math high. And he'll be like, I did it. I did it. I'm like, I'm like, look, see, 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 you like it. He's like, <laughs> he doesn't want to admit it. But also, you know, when you have a mom who's like so into math, as a preteen, there's going to be that desire to not want to be the same. Mm-hmm. Um, but I catch him all the time. I catch him all the time yeah. having a good time. And he loves science. And he openly and willingly admits that he loves science, especially chemistry. Awesome. I'm like, there's a lot of math on that, you know. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Hey, when did you discover that you had this passion and love for math? Oh my gosh, um, I always loved a good challenge, but in middle school, I was terrified of math. I used to come home and cry because I was afraid of my math homework. And then midway through the year, I, we got a new teacher, and she made it so much more fun. She actually she taught us functions like they were sausage factories, and that was like. I was like, oh my gosh, wait, what? That's amazing. And so, and you kiss my math, I actually do that. And I, of course, I credit her with it. Um, bringing stuff to life, making it just jump off the page. So that's when I discovered that math could be really fun. Mm-hmm. And then in, in, and then it was, and it was always a challenge, but I always embrace, I always liked that. I, I've always been the kind of person where if you say, that looks really hard, that probably can't be done. I'm like, really? Well, I mean, Maybe I should try. So, uh, for better or worse, that's part of my personality. Uh, in college, I really discovered that I, I discovered how good it made me feel really because I needed to get away from the whole wonder years thing for a minute. I needed to find out who else I was. And so taking a break from acting and throwing myself into math was wonderful, uh, for my own self esteem and for my own confidence just in myself as a person. Mm-hmm. Like where my value came from. So that was amazing for me. And then the next step up was after I graduated, so many people, especially women were like, oh my gosh, why would you study? Why would you do that to yourself? You're like, you've got a career. Like, why would you go to study math? I'm like, wait, what do you mean? It was great. I'm like, oh, I could never do math. Oh, and I saw so many people, especially women's confidence, just sort of like, just like, oh, it's like this skeleton in their closet. Like, yeah, I'm a great, happy person, but oh, math was just, that's just my Achilles heel. I'm like, wait a minute. Math doesn't have to be bad. And I've been through the thing where it was hard and then it wasn't. And then it was mm-hmm. doable because of how it was presented. So that's what started lighting a fire under me. And then I was, I was uh, invited to speak in front of Congress about the importance of women in mathematics right after college in the year 2000. And I was like, oh, my gosh, um, I studied the problem. I read this commission report. And I was like, middle school is the time when girls' confidence really drops in math and everyone's confidence does. It's the time of life that the wonder years was – was told, you know, about to start. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, the Wonder Years went all the way through high school, but it started in middle school because that's that's the time in life when kids are like, "Wait, who am I? Am I a cool kid? Am I? A, I, well, I don't know who I am, but I know math's got a bad reputation, so I don't want to be good at math." You know, that that kind of thing is happening, and the math is getting more complicated. So I'm like, all right, middle school is the time, and I just became really passionate uh, about it. At first, I was going to do like a video or something, and. I, I was sort of scrambling around, like, what am I going to do? How can I help? And I pledged to Congress that I would do my part to get math better PR. And I've been doing it ever since for more than 20 years now. <laughs> so it was 2005 when I started writing Math Doesn't Suck, and it came out in 2007. That's wonderful. Hey, yeah. you know, um, one of the neat things about having a podcast is that you – kind of get to do things that benefit myself or people that I love. I have a niece who's amazing, and she's entering Wentworth uh, Institute to study biomedical engineering. Um, oh young girl from originally from El Salvador, and she loves math, but she's going to be faced with some challenges. So can you give my niece, Jimena, a, a, a little um, piece of advice, something that could carry her through? Well, when math is challenging, that's the good stuff. When math, that's, when math is challenging, that's how you know that you're getting something really valuable out of it. And that's when you have the opportunity to separate yourself from a lot of people who would give up. That's when you go, oh, right now is the moment. This is the moment where I get to separate myself from the crowd. I have a choice. And I know that most people are going to go with what feels more comfortable, which is just to sort of give up. But I have a, I have a choice right now. Oh, wow. This is what, this is it. This is the moment that I get to choose what kind of person I'm 
going to be and, and that I'm going to succeed where others fail? Ah, good to know. Here it is, and I'm going to stick with it. And you do whatever you have to to get help. Um, you look at outside, outside resources. You can talk to your teacher, your professors, uh, whatever you need to do. You find that help because you will find it. And the reason you'll find it is because not everybody is looking for it, but you will. I love that. I, that's great advice to everyone. <laughs> that's true. That really is. That's true. Uh, Danica, uh, just please remind everybody again uh, your website where they can go to find out more about Double Puppy Trouble and all the amazing resources that you've created for parents. Thank you. Yes, mckellarmath.com. And there's a big slider button to, to show you, depending on the age of your child, what is the best McKellar Math book for you. And I'm going to tell you, parents, I'm here for you. Um, I have a book, no matter how old your kid is, all the way through high school geometry. I've got a book or two that will really make a difference. And I encourage you to enjoy the book with your kid if you can, especially the younger kid books. Yeah. Read with your kids. Absolutely. <laughs> We've had a great time speaking to the author of Double Puppy Trouble. Danica McKellar. Danica, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest will be Steph Winkler. She's a speech therapist, and she's the driving force behind SimplicityHappens.com. And she shares some great insights into speech development, some milestones we should be looking for, some interventions that we can uh, make sure our kids uh, get access to if they need it. And just an all-around overall great conversation. That's the next episode of the podcast. Hey, if you're the author of a fantastic children's book, please do visit readingwithyourkids.com. There's so many ways that we can help you celebrate your great book. If you click in the author's click here button at the top of readingwithyourkids.com, you can find out how you can be a guest here on the podcast and be able to say to your friends, hey, me and Danica McKella have something in common. We were both guests on the Reading With Your Kids podcast. You can also find out how you can submit your book to our certified great read panel. We let you know that our sponsors of today's show, the sponsors of today's show, The uh, Adventures of Toby Baxter and Skipper Friend of Foe are both certified great reads. You can find out what that's all about and how your book can earn that status by going to readingwithyourkids.com. You can also learn about our monthly promotion program and find out how we can help you celebrate your book through podcast commercials, through messages to our 100,000 plus social media followers, displaying your book on our nationwide network of digital pedestrian billboards, and have your book live and in person at whatever event we are at in a particular month. We're, we are part of some amazing events. We'll be there at the PTO Today Today Expo in St. Louis, Missouri. We'll be at the Orange County Children's Book Festival, the largest book children's book festival in North America. We're just at so many great, great places, and we would love for you to come out on tour with us, too. Readingwithyourkids.com. Authors click here button at the top of the page. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, we want to start by thanking our guest, Danica McKellar. Please be sure to check out Double Puppy Trouble and also check out McKellarMath.com. I want to thank our sponsors, The Adventures of Toby Baxter, The River Elf, The Giant, and The Closet by Tim Wright. And, of course, Skipper, Friend, or Foe by Kelly Sanchez. I want to thank my team, Fatima Khan, Rory Grady, Nicole Belcastro, Mirabella Q, Rain Pan, I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we all want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of The Reading With Your Kids Podcast.